On today's show, we get wild on the water. Hearts pound. Get the net. Get the net. As we team up with the Minnesota Wild, a first-of-a-kind fundraiser with the biggest names in Minnesota hockey. Next, you've all heard about the term high-tech for your phones or computers, but you know there's high-tech in your fishing boat, too? For our walk in the park this week, we have gorges, waterfalls, and even trails that connect to Superior National Forest. Where is this park? Well, follow the river. Our Minnesota Bound Classic this week deals with a dainty little bird that only weighs three grams less than a nickel. But what it lacks in weight, it makes up for in character. Those stories and more next. Minnesota Bound. Brought to you by Minnesota's select GMC dealers. Hi everybody, Raven and I welcome you to the show. I think she's ready to go fishing, right? Well, you know, Minnesota is known as the state of hockey, right? But what happens when hockey players from the wild go to Mille Lacs to chase bass? Minnesota becomes the state of fishing. Bill Shirk has the story. Something's blowing in on Minnesota's Mille Lacs Lake. Maybe it's a party in the making, or a new Minnesota tradition. Whatever this is, it's going to be wild on the water. So we're at the inaugural first annual Minnesota Wild Tournament on Lake Mille Lacs. Fantastic day, beautiful weather. Eight Team players and coaches. There you go. Where's the seatbelt? Team up with Team Ron Shera Productions, <laughs> plus a hockey fan in each boat, a fishing fundraiser that seems to have attracted a boatload of attention. I'm I'm excited to fish with Ron because he seems to know what he's doing, and I have no clue. This day starts with a parade. We have a milk run here. We're going to go here, and then there, and then there and then we're coming back with a whole bunch of bass or the tail between our legs. So the deal with this tournament is that we're going after bass. Three bass to be exact. There's a smallmouth right there. On a lake now known as the world's single best smallmouth fishery. There we go. I lost them. No! Oh. Too bad. Nothing ever goes as planned. I was already getting the net. All that matters is that I beat Ron, Bill, and Laura. Today, I don't want to talk about it. The fish proved tough to catch in most boats. Getting a good tan, though. That's, that's about all we're getting right now. Reel up, coach. Oh, you got a crayfish. This is Bruce's big catch of the day. Competition aside. Don't air this. It's okay. a secret. The Wild on the Water event also allows players, coaches, and fans to just hang out together and do, well, this. I feel like, uh, like I know the Ballard. We'll be spending Christmas together this yeah. year. Come, I'll give you my address, send me a Christmas card. Absolutely. This is uh, outstanding, man. It's just, I don't know how to describe it. Beautiful day and it's not so hot. Everything's really good. It sure is. Makalit, where's that net? With his fishing expertise, he said, we're going where we always go. We came here and we caught fish. It's the lure of Mille Lacs bass fishing. Fish on, boys. Get the net, get the net. Good job. Oh. Yes, sir. Let me tell you what, how much pressure that takes <laughs> off of me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, to come in empty handed. Whoa. That's wild on the water. You know, I think that's a really cool thing. It's, uh, it's giving back you know, to the Wild Foundation, to the community, and you know, it's, it's been a really cool event. Which culminates with a party back at home base. Are you guys excited to see who has the biggest fish? Should be interesting. Uh, at least we got our limits, so hopefully our weigh-in total's good. One by one. I got two. All 18 teams weigh in fish. Do you think 
your bag has the weight to put you now in first place. Um, no, zero chance. <laughs> I had a couple bites, but I didn't end up getting anything, so um, I came up empty-handed today. We would be the Colorado Rockies with oh. the NHL right now, or Avalanche, sorry. Oh. 11, 7, 2, your new leaders for the Bass Fishing Tournament. But like any competition, someone always wins. I just want to know what those weigh. Well, you got to That's the suspense <laughs> of it all for a second. Just, just wait tell a me what second. Those weigh. A granddaddy. Look at that. 13-3-2. These are your winners. This is uh, it's unreal. And to hear the Wilds announce the uh, donations they're going to do to the different organizations, that's, that's great. And I hope it just grows and gets bigger from this point. This is a true testament that it's the state of hockey. Uh, we had a great turnout. Everyone was in wild gear. Everyone loves hockey. Everyone loves fishing. It's a great combination. This is where we're at right now. Coming up, you won't believe how technology can play a role in your fishing boat. Minnesota Bound, brought to you by Minnesota Select GMC Dealers. Jesse Treble's Safe Basements of Minnesota. Heavenroot, the official outboard motor of Minnesota bound. And by Kinetico. You know, when I was a boy, my dad had a wooden boat with a five horse outboard motor. Now look at me today. I have this glitzy Ranger with a 115 horse Evinrude. Only shows you that fishing has not stood still. It is now high tech. Fishing in Minnesota. Oh yes, a timeless pursuit on a hazy, lazy day. On a dock, in a boat. As somebody once said, fishing leads to a state of mind where we are free. Yes, sir. <laughs> there we go. So simple, right? Well, it's not so simple anymore. Today's advancements include better boats and motors, Better rods and better reels. Monofilament line was a big advancement, now braided line. But the most significant advancement in fishing occurred something like 60 years ago, when a man named Carl Arantz developed something called a fish locator or depth finder. That's what we fishermen called it. But it changed fishing and still does to this day. This is our sonar screen. What we're actually using is, a, is sound waves through the water this unit is connected to the back of the boat there's something called a transducer the transducer will send sound waves to the bottom come back and tell us what the bottom is like what kind of bottom it is how deep of water it is and when there's objects in between or if you see fish on the display we'll mark that also sonar sound waves transducer 60 years ago this was new fishing terminology introduced by an oklahoma entrepreneur carl lawrence he invented a green box called a fish locator in 1959, bringing sonar into sport fishing boats. In the early 70s, Lawrence brought his green box to Minnesota to show pro anglers such as the Lindner brothers or Gary Roach, even me, the wonders of a device that could see fish. Faster than you can say fish on, the sport of angling became high tech and it's never stopped. Now this is what we call a multifunction display. Multifunction means this is our sonar display. We also do GPS. Yeah, this is where we're at right now. You can see we're here up on a, more of a reef, shallower water coming into a little bit deeper. We can zoom in and zoom out, tell exactly where our location is. And then if I saw some fish here, if I caught a fish here, what can I do? What we can do is hit a button here and save a waypoint. So I could go back to that spot if I wanted to. Correct. Dan also demonstrated something called structure scan that shows different views of the bottom. Side imaging shows what's below on each side of the boat, or straight down called down scan. Let's go back to the sonar, plain sonar a second. This is where it all began, but, but much nicer with the screen and the whole... The screen, the bottom, the way we tell you what's, what's happening down there. We use colors to describe what's going to be a harder bottom or a softer bottom. 
You know, years ago, Dan, Minnesota legislature considered making these devices illegal because they thought the fish didn't stand a chance. But what it's really done for me, and I think I can speak for a lot of anglers, is this adds to my enjoyment of fishing. And I can tell you plenty of times when the fish won the ball game. Okay, buddy, thanks for playing the game. And next, why Temperance River State Park should be on your list of parks to visit. Closed captioning is brought to you by Border View Lodge. Walk in the Park is brought to you by the Minnesota Zoo, connecting people to animals and nature to help save wildlife around the world. All right, it's time to go for a walk in the park. Where are we going? This time, Temperance River State Park up on the North Shore. You're gonna love it there. Josh Bryan, our photojournalist, has the story. We're on the North Shore, Lake Superior, Temperance River State Park. Temperance River has a, a couple of really popular attractions. The river gorge that was carved by the Temperance River is really unique. Um, the rock has been cleaved by the river and is exceptionally narrow and uh, provides some really tremendous scenery of a really unique river that uh, is kind of unlike any place else on the North Shore. I love it. This Temperance is probably one of my favorites. It almost doesn't look like Minnesota. It's really pretty. I mean, you have the bridge over there and you can even, there's a trail on the other side of 61 that you can even walk and um, kind of follow as well the Temperance River going back towards into the, the woods. There's the main kind of two to 300 acre area around the Temperance River itself. And then we have the Carlton Peak area, which uh, contains Carlton Peak, which is a 1500 foot a North Recite dome. Carlton Peak is about three miles from the mouth of the river. Um, Lake Superior is right around 500 feet elevation. Carlton Peak is over 1500. So in that three mile stretch, you can gain a thousand feet of elevation, which is pretty rare in Minnesota, which is a relatively flat state. So this is uh, the view from uh, the old quarry on top of Carlton Peak. Um, on a clear day, we'd be seeing all the way over to the Apostle Islands in Wisconsin. Today, we got a little more of a screen view. Beautiful rainy afternoon on the North Shore, but uh, even on a day like today, we got this view and uh, we have it all to ourselves. So not every day you get to sit, have a million dollar view to yourself. I wouldn't let a little bit of rain get in the way of enjoying yourself. It just brings out a new character. The greens are more vibrant. The sounds are different. There's some areas that are pretty rugged with uh, stone surfaces that you have to ne negotiate and other areas that are more graveled trails or even a little bit of paved trails. So a little bit of something for everybody along there. So the Temperance River Gorge is contained in the bottom quarter mile section of the Temperance River. It's an area that's really got unique geology where the river's cut a very narrow chasm through the bedrock. The rushing water obviously is the best part. It almost seems like it's dangerous, but you're clearly safe the whole time. It's pretty amazing the power that's contained in that river as it's squeezed down to just this narrow gap, which is only five or six feet across in spots. To have all that channeled through a narrow area, just uh, it can be really powerful and uh, deserves a lot of respect. How to describe it? Hmm. Temperance River, it just has a lot to offer with everything from the lake shore to the Temperance River Gorge, which is really unique. And then you have Carlton Peak, which provides these vast views of the area around it. You know, amongst the three parks that I manage, Temperance has got kind of a special place for me. It's um, especially in the mornings and evenings when things are a little quieter. It's really peaceful to sit by the river and uh, along the lake shore. If I were to ever move away, this would be one of my places to definitely come back to see. A lot of people haven't been up here who live in Minnesota, so I would definitely recommend it.
still ahead, it's about a man and his hummingbirds. Lots and lots of hummingbirds, to be exact. Minnesota Bound, brought to you by Ellsworth Cooperative Creamery. Minnesota Rebath. And by Totem Resorts. the hummingbird so tiny so interesting but nobody knows that better than the subject of our next story the hummingbird man can I use the binoculars meet the lovebirds David and Vicki Weiniger there's hummy oh, up in the tree from their perch on a still? porch the Weinigers yeah. check out their feathered so. neighbors it really has grown while the backyard welcome mat is always out for any bird the star of this story weighs less than a penny and flies at speeds up to 60 miles per hour. The ruby-throated hummingbird. Right behind some leaves. Well, he's hidden in there. Watching hummingbirds is nothing new for this Minnesota couple. Just see for more than a dozen years, this tiniest of birds, whose heart beats more than a thousand times a minute, has been the subject of an amazing movie plot filmed in their own backyard. I had noticed a, a hummingbird in the front one of the trees. I thought, it seems like there's something there on that branch. And I went over and I got so excited <laughs> because that was one of my dreams. Coming Actually, through. she shrieked. I shrieked. <laughs> Dave was Shrieking Vicky had found a hummingbird nest, which is no easy task. The nest, camouflaged with lichens and spider webs, is almost invisible. Home to the hummingbird is no bigger than a 50 cent piece. To capture the rare discovery, David and Vicki purchased a video camera and pushed record. Rolling from one summer to the next, their camera collected more than 65 hours of video featuring the life and times of ruby-throated hummingbirds. The thing with hummingbirds, everything interesting happens quickly. So quickly. And literally in a half a second, you either see something cool or you miss it. As it turned out, the camera's eye didn't miss much. Starting on a pine branch, the nest building begins. Spider webs are tucked in place for support. Lichens are added for, well, only the hummingbirds know. To see the size of the nest, you know, about that big around, and then two little eggs in there or look like little jelly beans. It took me four microphones, and I don't know why, until I could get it. I had three that were recording, and they would not pick up the wing beats. So I finally bought a fourth uh, microphone, and I had to have it just above the head, and the bird would be feeding when the microphone was right there. Eventually, the hummingbird filmmakers decided to make their own hummingbird movie. There's my 80 or so tapes that Vicki and I took when we were filming the bird. Which required a video editing system complete with a computer. It's my favorite part of the whole movie, up to the end. Which started an editing project lasting three and a half years. I spent a week on this scene. Finally, their hummingbird version of Gone with the Wind was complete. The name um, originally was going to be More Than a Glimpse. And uh, then one of our songs that we ended up using was Wind Dancer. And we figured, Wind Dancers, that's perfect. Hmm. And that's a wrap. You know, you watch hummingbirds and you say to yourself time and time again, how do they survive, huh? Apparently quite well. Well, that about does it for us. Introduce a kid to the great outdoors. Raven and I are going fishing. Of course, she is the star of the show. Transportation provided by Premier Transportation. Call 1-800-899-7433.
To get more Minnesota Bound, including full episodes, go to mnbound.com. And to follow our latest adventures, like us on Facebook 